Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to our debate about the future. Uh, so very wide uh, topic that we should be covering today. Apologies for a slight delay, but because of the previous panel overrunning a bit late, because of the live streaming, uh, we have started a little bit late. We also have another difficult task of, on top of predicting the future and what this future is gonna be like. We're also standing between you and the world's best female chef. So we'll try to be as productive as we can uh, in this about an hour where we are going to try to talk to two thinkers, two of our distinguished panelists today, who are going to tell us how they see future. And we're talking here sort of looking towards 2030 and maybe beyond. So not necessarily the immediate future. Um, so the two our distinguished speakers are Tanya Fayon, who is a member of the European Parliament, a vice president of the SND, SND and also Slovene, Social Democrats in Slovenia. She holds a degree in journalism. She was also a colleague of mine before, a passionate advocate of freedom of movement and its economic benefits, as it's written here in the newspaper. And the other distinguished guest today is Professor Jacques Rupnik, who is professor at Science Po in Paris, but also in Bruges, where is his visiting professor. Even Krastev, unfortunately, could not join us because he got ill. So uh, I have to apologize his attendance. So what we are going to do today is we are going to talk about the future and how do we see that future that is going to be influencing not only Europe, but also obviously also going beyond. So but we have heard quite a lot of ideas already in the panels preceding our discussion now. I will come back to this. But I would like to start maybe as an icebreaker. Uh, can we actually predict the future in this day and age when you know, we go to bed and the next morning a nuclear bomb has gone off? President uh, Trump has tweeted something in 140 characters. To me, it, it appears that the future was much more predictable in the past and now it's a little bit less predictable. Am I wrong or am I right? Tanya, maybe. If I, if I say, um, can we actually say with certainty what is right or what is wrong? I think not really. So I think it's very difficult to predict a clear future. I don't think that anyone has an answer, but we have some visions and some ideas where do we want to go. And Dragan, you said at the beginning, Jacques and I are thinkers. I would say Jacques is a thinker, I'm a politician, but I'll do my best. Um, I do remember when I was a journalist in Paris, I often made interviews with Jacques commenting the political situation in Paris and how much has changed in the last 10 years also when I look at the political situation in Paris and in the European Union. So it's very challenging today to discuss about Europe. I have my ideas and I believe that during the discussion in the next hour we will share them, but I don't think that we will find the answers. This, yeah. Um, well, just to follow, I hope we are still able to distinguish right and wrong. Uh, <laughs> at least it's a very old fashioned way of approaching our subject. I, I do believe we still have to try at least. But anyway, uh, before we get to right and wrong, uh, we have the future and the present. I, I'm not keen on futurology as a subject. Uh, so uh, do not expect anything like that. Uh, I have two caveats about, about the forecasting of the future. Uh, one is Václav Havel and one is Sartre. Václav Havel, um, in a wonderful speech he gave in Paris at our school for the 20th anniversary of 1989, spoke about the people who used to come to see him in Prague in the 1980s. And they were, he said, they were explaining to me what is possible and what is not, how the world is running, etc., etc. And they seemed to present to me the laws of history. This is what the laws are supposed to be. And then came 1989, and he said, I didn't predict it, but they were even worse than I was. These social scientists, etc. You know, they are great 
to explain after the event why what has happened was necessary and inevitable. Yes, that they predict. They can explain 1989 after. But they didn't have a clue, and Václav Havel said, nor did I. <laughs> uh, but so that's one about the unpredictability of history and the great surprises, good or bad, right or wrong, <laughs> uh, uh, that it can reserve. The second <laughs> caveat is from uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. When they asked him uh, in the 1960s uh, uh, whether he reads science, science fiction, whether he likes science fiction, he, he used to say, I like science fiction uh, because it gives us the exact measure of the fear we have of ourselves. And I think that this is there's something to both <laughs> to both quotes, that of Havel about those who pretend to know the laws of history and get surprised because they cannot predict anything, and the Sartre comment, which we actually are confronted we are with both things, the total unpredictability, you mentioned in your introduction, and this new technological challenge because we are in an era since 1989 where the future had disappeared. The big future promises, the big narratives, the big ideologies that were promising either radiant future or this and that and the other, those big ideologies have disappeared. Perhaps I may add, it's not just the socialist promise that has vanished in 1989, it may be that it was closing a two century of belief in progress. So to that extent, that vision of a future as a promise, as a narrative, as a utopia, what have you, that uh, is gone. And what remains now is the future connected with technological change economic change, right? So we were uh, in the panel I attended this afternoon, some attention was already devoted to it, I don't want to go back. But clearly, new communication technologies, and uh, now artificial intelligence, all the things, all the debate about the future is now focused on science and, te and, and technology. And that I find uh, sort of uh, pretty close to what Sartre warning <laughs> was about. <laughs> It gives us the exact measure of the fear we have of ourselves. Yes, and we'll come back to technological uh, advances because that is gonna shape the future. There's no doubt about it. And we heard this already in the panels before us. But let's just maybe step just very quickly. Can we talk about the future if we don't say, look into what's happening now? Both of you have actually said that the Euro crisis and migration crisis has actually changed both Europe and the world. And this has had such an effect now that it does actually affect how we are seeing the future. I mean, I, when I say uh, what I said about my reservations, it's just to say I don't believe in futurology. I, don't, I believe it is serious to try to, not just to guess, but at least to think, either through analogies. That's one way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Ivan Krastev, who is not here, uh, uh, was with me over the last two or three years at several meetings in Vienna where we compared the end of the European Union compared at one meeting with a breakup of the Habsburg Empire, on a second meeting, breakup of uh, the USSR, and a third breakup of Yugoslavia. You make your pick, <laughs> which you prefer, and we may think through analogies. That's one way of thinking about the future is thinking through analogies. Another way you may think about trends. You want to comp look at current trends and their projection. If I tell you that in 1990, just after the end of the, uh, 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 of the Cold War, the West, that is North America and Europe, represented 60% of the world GDP, and that it is 40% a quarter century later, that is the most dramatic shift, and that is a trend that is very important if you want to look forward. So trends, that is yes, and projection of, uh, of trends. And finally, 
there are scenarios. One way of thinking about the future is not to say, I have the blueprint, etc. But here are the scenarios for Europe, for instance. And, you know, we have the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, uh, it's not because one of those three scenarios will materialize. And maybe I will, maybe in our discussion we will come to this question how these scenarios may look like, but at least the scenarios reintroduce the idea that we can do something about it. And that's politics. I mean, it brings us as actors. There are different scenarios. We may want to facilitate one or uh, oppose another. And that's where politics come in, and that's where Tanya comes in. So what challenges do you see now in Europe at this point in time that are going to shape our future? First of all, thinking about the future is always um, we need to understand the past and current problems that are happening in Europe. And what I'm lacking is for sure a clear leadership. I think we lost a lot of strategic goals while union on what was based. If you look for the last, I don't know, eight, ten years, we went through several crises. We go from one crisis to another, be it from economic, financial, moral, social, um, unemployment of youth, um, difficult wars, um, violences, migration crisis in the neighborhood. We just managed to somehow stop or partially stop the crisis. There is another one. And throughout this development, we really lost as a union what is this strategic goal. I think we have to go back to fundamental values. When we say today we speak about peace and stability, fundamental values, it's not something that is self-obvious. It's very prestigious when we look at the world around us. And another thing, if you look at the situation today, I think in Europe we see the return of the politic of paranoia. If you look, we have a lot of alternative facts. We have um, intolerance, liberalism, nationalism. All these are very serious threats to our society. And not only the barriers that we have on the borders that are the consequence of the migration and refugee situation, it's also the barrier of the mind. I think we have today the fight between inclusion, exclusion, between open and closed societies. So this is something I think in the world of globalization that are with many new challenges that we are facing in Europe of today. What I see in Brussels also when I mentioned at the beginning the lack of leadership, strong leadership, is that we have today when we are discussing in the institutions, be it in European Parliament or in the European Council or the Commission, every decision is based on the phone call to Berlin, more or less. This is the new reality. Maybe in, in the future, hopefully, to Paris again, but it's not currently the case. So the Council that used to have a power, it's now the more the club of different interest groups. Um, lack of solidarity, the Commission, in fact, that we hope to be a strong political engine, it's not um, anymore the commission as a such. So we have a lot of member states that are actually going into nationalism or into individualism and also the societies as such. So there are a lot of challenges I see and especially if I look today's young generation that is completely bombarded with internet, with social media, with floods of news that are actually not anymore um, credible news, but a lot of fake news and also a lot of hate speech. So this is the reality we have to tackle today and create back the, these values that we are speaking. Okay, so let's talk about then the leadership. It was also mentioned by Mr. Timmermans today in, in the panel. So in order to predict future, to know what the future is going to hold, we need leaders. What kind of leadership do we have on the EU level, but also on the national levels today? And Maybe, Jacques, because you, know, you live in France, is really Macron this new, gener this new leader that is emerging in Europe, as some analysts are saying? Well, we will see whether he is that leader, but he certainly has the ambition, and leadership is part of what he tries to project. In his latest interview, I mean, it's almost unheard of in the age of Twitter, you know, 15 words, uh, messages. He delivers a 20-page interview in the weekly Le Point. And this is a, I, I invite people, who, those who have time and read French, this is worth reading because the guy is a serious intellectual. 
So this is very unusual. You have a serious intellectual who has sort of strayed into politics. Uh, that is unusual, and therefore, leadership only matters if you have a vision. This is where, uh, 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 I mean, leadership for its own sake <laughs> can be, as we know from history, <laughs> can be uh, uh, simply authoritarianism or, or lead to dictatorship. No, we want leadership on a European level. You remember a book by Jack Hayward uh, called Leaderless Europe. And he, in that book, uh, uh, he was arguing that the fact that Europe is leaderless, because this is not a new situation, was natural because the whole point about the European Union that it was built against emergence of a dominant leader, of a dominant power. Uh, this is why when you say Germany, etc., that may be a very short transitory period. This is not something that, that would be the unraveling of the European Union, clearly. If you had one dominant power, you know, the Poles or the French will never accept that uh, they will be, uh, 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 that Europe will be run uh, from Berlin. No, that, that is not an acceptable proposition. So, uh, you know, you know uh, uh, Thomas Mann's famous uh, uh, word, we need a European Germany so that we don't have a German Europe. Well, today we have both, and, and that is not uh, a very sound situation. So, yes, we need leadership after a long period too long period, where we had Europe administered by managers. I think the Barroso Commission for me epitomized the era of the managers, low profile politically. They will not be disturbing the, <laughs> the this is why they were liked <laughs> by, the, uh, 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 by the heads of governments and heads of state. They will not be interfering in their, in their, uh, uh, in their game. So uh, 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 we had, the era of managers, and that's okay for fair weather uh, period. If you are in a crisis like we've entered with in, in, in uh, 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 2008, and followed by other crises, as Tanya mentioned, uh, international crisis in our neighborhood, migrant crisis, etc., this is no longer good enough. So this is where politics has to return. And the future of Europe, if Europe is to have a future, it has to reclaim politics. It has to reclaim itself as a political project. Too many people, and maybe the Brexit has now exposed this, because the, some new member states that I am very familiar with uh, had the vision of Europe which goes roughly like this. Security, this is NATO and the US. This is where security is. Politics. That's a matter of nation state. This is democracy in our nation states. We have elections, etc. And then economy and trade and such things. Well, that is the European Union. That is, that's, if you want for short, the British vision of Europe. Well, that is no long, that's over. That is over. If Europe is to survive, politics has to return and to address the issues that we are talking about. Either uh, uh, the survival of Europe. This is not just a technical economic matter. This is a political issue. Uh, the question of migrants of Europe's borders. One thing is to abolish Schengen, as Chancellor Merkel did. The next thing is you must uh, 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 replace it by something else, Schengen too. And that's politics. And similarly about security. Well, look at our neighborhoods. You look east and you have the Ukrainian hybrid war, as it is called, and annexation, etc. So you have, you have a, 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 a serious challenge in the East, and you have the southern neighborhood of the EU that has unraveled with collapsing states, uh, 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 mass migration, terrorist threats, etc. This is politics, only political answers. So the future of Europe, if this is the question, Bring back politics. This is what's happening with Macron and as soon as German elections will be completed, that will be made much more explicit, I hope. And uh, 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 if politics is back, a uh, number of issues that have been related to the disaffection of the public with the EU, the, loss of con the feeling of the loss of control, etc., will 
maybe be addressed because at the end of the day, they thought they were dodging the issue by evacuating politics. We are just doing business as usual, this is economics, this is, and then they appear in the eyes of everybody, Europe simply as a tool of globalization, of economic globalization, with a return of politics, addressing the key issues of concerns to Europeans, this is also a chance to reconnect with the citizens. Okay. okay, let's talk about this, because this is one revolution that is gonna happen. So we need more political decisions, we need politics back in, in, into Europe, as you said. But for that, basically what's happening is a democratic revolution. And for that, we also need to see how we re-engage with the new generation. Because the new generation is much more demanding, it's much, much more dynamic, has different needs and sees things differently. And so, Tanya, you as a politician, how can we basically, how can we make this new generation be more engaged uh, with, uh, with politics? Because that's uh, what Professor Rupnik has said, we need it. I'm going back also to the statement by Mr. Timmermans who said, he gave us answer, and let's see whether you agree with that. He, his answer was, let the young politicians become part of the political parties and influence them. Is that the solution for the new generation which demands politics to be done differently? I mean, first, you, you said a democratic revolution is also a democratic deficit, but this is another issue, but we see that in many countries in European Union, huge democratic deficit. But speaking about the youth in Europe, we saw with Brexit, and that was also said today in panel, that uh, the majority of young people that, that would really concern them didn't go and cast the vote. So how to engage young people? We often discuss that, whether this is a solution to bring them to politics, listen to their ideas. Young people, I always believe, are very revolutionary. In any case, this, you cannot take them, so they will um, act, but we have to somehow listen what they say. I try often to bring their ideas um, on board, but on the other hand, I think this is a challenge. I, today, young people can, in Slovenia, you have different aspects. Um, they have more maybe than any generation before. If you look, they have access to internet, they have mobility, they have Erasmus programs, they can go to study, they can travel abroad. If you look, there's a generation on one hand that has much more than anyone before. But then is a conflict, they also have less opportunities because it's more difficult to get jobs, it's a different situation, it's more competitiveness, they have to be more creative, and not everyone can be like that. So um, I think we have to find good models to give them opportunities to find work and some future and I would say um, opportunities to survive. Is we see today in many countries, not only in Slovenia, if you look further to the Western Balkan, that's, it's our close neighborhood. It's brain drain happening tremendously. People, young people living our countries and they are searching opportunities elsewhere, going to the west of Europe, going to Australia, Canada, I don't know. Um, and this is what we have to create conditions that they have a possibility to maybe get education, get experiences abroad, but then be welcome to come back home. And this is where I see the future for young people. This exchange of creative ideas, of knowledge, of experience, and then having freedom of movement in Europe, also when it comes to freedom of education. But Equal opportunities for young people, and with internet, globalization, new development, new tools, I think they have fantastic possibilities, but we have to give them a chance to develop. May I add to this? Okay, I, uh, I subscribe to, to, to most of what has just been said and uh, I like the, uh, Mr. Timmermans uh, uh, take on this. Uh, basically saying uh, for young people, for the young generation to have an impact of the system, on, on the system, well, one way of doing it is to abstain, to withdraw, to be, okay, that's, uh, that, that's what's been happening. Uh, he basically said, no, you have to engage and you, you, may, you, may, change the, you may change the parties, the system, etc. cetera. And that, that's, that's my take as well. If you can't beat them, join them. That's, that's, that's the recipe and, and, and that, that's where it should be. The second thing is I do not have, like many people I had the impression this afternoon, this cult 
of necessary positive change coming from youth. I mean, I'm constantly surrounded with young people and they are wonderful and you know, I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing as a teacher just because I love contact with them and because they, they, this is very challenging and very interesting. However, if you look, if you simply think that the revival of Europe or of democratic, uh, uh, challenging democratic deficit will come from young people, it may or it may not. Young people can also be engaged in very uh, 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 um, anti-democratic, uh, uh, hostile, radical movements, which uh, uh, may be a form of protest. I say the young people have always been on the side of progress. Well, you know, uh, uh, if you look at Jobbik in Hungary, it's, it's, it's built a lot with young people. Uh, extreme right wing, yes, they are there, marching with their boots and they're young and angry and very nasty, and not just in Hungary, I'm just saying in Hungary because that's the latest. I mean, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the young uh, Islamists that blow up uh, 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 their uh, 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 fellow countrymen who, uh, who come to listen to a rock concert, uh, like happened in Paris, they are young. <laughs> they are young, and being young is, is, is great, but I mean, there is a kind of, in the discourse, there is a danger of a Peter Pan syndrome, you know. Uh, being young is wonderful, and it is, you know, it, it is wonderful, but the wisdom is not there. Same, same argument could be applied with civil society because young people are the most engaged in civil society, which is one way to revigorate democracy in Europe. Absolutely, some of my best friends are part of civil society, and I'm part of I don't know how many organizations. And here comes my follow-up question to this. Uh, but we have also part of civil society, you know, we have also organizations that are not exactly democratic, and they are part of civil society, and they are a threat, they are anti-European, and a threat to democracy, and they are part of civil society, and they're full of young people. So, you know, just to qualify, if we look to the future, we should take that as well into account. Uh, if, I, if I just may to add, because I think it's very dangerous, maybe I was just a little bit um, jumping, when, when we speak about young revolutionary ideas, and then in the next sentence mentioning young Islamist ideas, I think it's very dangerous to put it that close together because this is something very much different when we speak here about second, third generation of migrant kids or people that have no perspectives, living in a suburbs, no chance to education, no chance for jobs, then they can be really quickly radicalized. And very quickly they lose their identity through Twitters, Facebook, and very quickly they can go in radicalism and take the weapons and we see what we see. But absolutely I would, that is a crime and it's separated from Revolution. having youth that is Well, there's a big debate among experts. Basically there are two theses. There are those who say uh, it is Islam that has got radicalized in the Middle East and that has an impact on Islam in Europe. And then you have others Olivier Roy, leading expert, now, who says, no, it is radicalism that has got Islamicized. So just as uh, 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 in the 1970s, you know, uh, uh, radical terrorists were, uh, 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 you know, Maoist or, I don't know, extreme left-wing uh, ideology, today uh, they, they are uh, Islamist. So there's a big debate among experts. I'm, I'm not an expert on that. I'm just saying this debate, uh, is it the radicalization of Islam, or is it uh, uh, the Islamization of radicality, of revolutionary uh, radicality, if you want? Uh, th that is a debate with, among academic experts, but everybody <coughs> understands it has a very important political implications as well. Okay, let's wrap up this part. So we're talking about democratic revolution that's happening. Just last question on this. Is this, is in, in the future, are we going to have political parties? Is this the model for political engagement, for having EU being political, as Jacques, you said? Or is it civil society or something else? Macron started not as a political party, he started as a movement. Is that the new trend in politics? Um, <laughs> we are discussing since a long time what is changing in the traditional political parties. So we see a lot of new movements or parties that have uh, very dangerous ideas. So I would say also when we talk about populism, it's not um, necessarily it's a dangerous populism, but we see a lot of dangerous populism. 
um, that it's creating some sort of a fear that then can control it and doesn't have really answers to the solutions. So I'm not sure how the traditional political parties in the globalized world with all the challenges we have around, how the society is developing, um, with all the differences, how they will survive. But certainly, um, after the elections, nevertheless, in Austria, in Netherlands, in um, France, we see that at least there are strong, again, pro-European sentiment. So that all these dangerous populists or nationalist ideas didn't win to the extent that we feared. So I would say this is now maybe a positive element we can all political forces of movements grab to keep and preserve either European Union or European unity and even strengthen it. So it can be a chance also for traditional political parties. Okay. Yeah. I would agree with that. That is, uh, the, this is a challenge for the traditional parties which have been declining everywhere. The two main pillars, right, left, social democrat, everywhere weaken. Germany, to some extent, is an exception, but that should not uh, uh, delude us about the general trend. Look at the Austrian elections. You had two candidates for the presidency, neither of them from the two main parties. Look at the French uh, presidential election. <laughs> Again, neither of them from the two main parties. Okay, I don't want to generalize, but you got the point. This is, the, this is a trend. It's present everywhere. And the question is, Yes, we see that the traditional party system is in trouble. We see also that the traditional simply right-left divide that we inherited, not just from the 20th century, but I would say from the French Revolution, that has been also uh, nowadays blurred or undermined, or at least these terms, which I s still believe are legitimate and valid, need to be redefined. What is it to be on the left today? It's no longer to be a social democrat like it was the case uh, in the previous century, where it was essentially about social justice, redistribution, the welfare state, etc. You have to reinvent what the left means. The left thought that one way of reinventing itself is to move from social issues to societal issues. So suddenly you move uh, uh, from the question of the workers, basically, to uh, 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 women issue, gender, gay uh, marriage, uh, multiculturalism, etc. So you address a whole range of societal issues. Is this the future of left-wing politics? Question mark. Uh, yeah, same thing on the, on the right. Uh, what is it to be, uh, I don't know, a conservative uh, uh, today? Uh, what is it what is it you want to conserve? <laughs> uh, what is it you want to preserve? When I see Orban and Kaczynski say, we need a, counter, a cultural counter-revolution in Europe, they, they, they call for a counter-revolution. Well, they are conservatives. They say, we are there in the you know, cultural conservatives against this European project, which has gone taken over by left-wing agendas. This is what they're saying, and that's, and that's what I'm saying. And what they propose is a cultural counter-revolution. So culture wars, cultural wars are a key element in the future shaping of the political divides. Not the only one, of course, but very important to an extent that it was not the case before. Second point, you have to invent new forms of political participation. Clearly the old system where you vote for the party your father voted for, who himself voted, etc., etc., and you were part of a structure, of a network. That no longer works. No, we have zapping voters today. And I think this is an issue that has been around for a while. Uh, if I again go back to my friend Václav Havel, I remember people were mocking him when he uh, was saying in the early days of the 1990s, that he didn't want to just reproduce a Western party system, that he believed that the new politics after 1989 should be inspired by the ethos of dissent that they were caring for. And basically, uh, that meant ethics and politics. It meant civil society 
and it means a European dimension. If I take those three issues, ethics and politics, this is a crucial issue everywhere. Question of corruption, question of transparency, etc. Civil society, when Havel was saying you cannot have political parties without civil society, without connection, we clearly understand today that these parties are dying because they do not have this interaction, interpenetration with civil society. And finally, the European dimension. There will not be a renewal of democratic politics simply on a national level for the reason I mentioned. If the economy is European or global and politics is national, you have such discrepancy that you've emptied politics of its substance. The only way to reclaim politics, democratic politics, is to create, to help create a European political subject or European political subjects in a plural. For that, you need a European public space. So this is a European public space. That means communication, media, meetings like this. <laughs> Maybe we are unwittingly <laughs> participating in something like that. This is what I believe that is a legacy, what Havel understood to be the legacy of dissent, and that was mocked by people like Klaus who are saying, no, we want the standard parliamentary democracy. These dissident intellectuals are, the, no. When I think back at that issue, we missed something after 1989, and now the present European crisis, which is also a crisis of democracy, brings those issues back. Tanya, your last thoughts on this, because then I still want to talk about uh, sort of economic and technological revolution. We already uh, mentioned that, but there's also a few people who are very eager to say something. So. Tanya, let's have your word. Just on briefly, that. on uh, what I see as a challenge for the left also and uh, for Europe is uh, how to address security. And the uh, European Union was always promoting fundamental universal rights. Now we are promoting, if I look at the agenda, mostly security. And we are building a lot of measures, if I look, fight against terrorism, building the borders, threatening outside borders. We are investing a lot of money in border security. So it's very much security-run agenda, and for left, for sure, and also for Europe, I would say, um, it's very difficult how to find the balance between security, how to address also social security, security of people, and find a balance between this security for people to feel safe in the defense way, what the maybe conservatives or the right is pushing the agenda, but also have the security like a personal security, having jobs, having um, education, etc. And this question of security, I think Europe is struggling, also the left is struggling. Okay, then let's talk a little bit briefly about economic and technological revolution, which is another revolution that is taking place. And today has been mentioned, digitalization has been mentioned several, several times in the panels before us. Uh, in a way that is gives us a huge opportunities and also to Europe and the world, but it also gives us some threats as well, because this could still uh, mean rise of unemployment, it could be more inequalities in societies, and after all, maybe even the disappearance, final disappearance of the middle class. So this is all the challenges that face Europe. And also talking about the economic model, you know, we have seen that the approach so far in the crisis hasn't worked. Are we ready for this new economic model for Europe and then that we can possibly export it to the world. I think that the fourth industrial revolution is happening much faster than we are really ready to answer. And um, I just recently had a discussion when we see all the robots or the, the revolution around us. A lot of people see robots, for example, something that is, yes, it will help, it's innovation, it will make my life easier. But there are a lot of people who are afraid I will lose job. So it's creating a lot of new imbalances. So we will tax robots, how we will develop, how we will secure our jobs and people that will stay behind. And this is happening. So it's a really fast development. It's always, I would say, an opportunity, but it's of course also a challenge. And um, I, we are having digital agenda. We heard today it's a very, very much focused European politics on the digital agenda. And this is certainly the future. But it's also a big challenge, I would say. Well, Tanya is the ex technology expert. I'm, I'm, I'm just on the receiving end of it and, and, uh, and very often perplexed by the ambivalence, as always, with technological change. This is a recurring debates, 
you go back to 19th century, any technological, you mentioned the fourth revolution. Well, that was the case with the previous technological revolution. I would say that um, the best way to judge these technological uh, promises is whether they have delivered. So I remember when internet was introduced, everybody said, oh, this is wonderful. This is a new age of democracy. This will be horizontal. You have direct communication. End of this uh, hierarchical, vertical politics. This is great thing for democracy, for, for participation, for civil society, etc." And, you know, it, it, it was rather, uh, uh, yeah, attractive idea. Well, you look back over the last 20 years and look at the balance sheet and, uh, well, to put it mildly, this has been a mixed blessing because, of course, uh, yes, you can have civil society organizations uh, on the horizontal level, but what has it produced? It has produced also a segmentation of the public space. People communicate within their group. Yeah within their community, their ethnic group, their national group, their uh, gender group, what have you. Uh, you have segmentation of public space. Uh, you have the extraordinary cacophony of uh, 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 the internet, the permanent news, etc. The tyranny of the present uh, is, you, you, you ask us about the future? Well, this is it. We live under the tyranny of the present. Uh, 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 the past, oh, the past comes in, when we want to rename statues of people we don't, we don't like because of current political circumstances. You know, latest news is in New York, they're considering you know, doing away with Christoph Columbus. Yeah, terrible mistake, he discovered America, so to speak. Okay, parenthèse refermé. So this is, and therefore, we uh, uh, live in this, uh, 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 yeah, segmented, fragmented, present-oriented, public space, uh, which uh, is a product of the, of the new technology. You know, I don't want to dwell in too, you know, because as everybody else, I, I use it, and I use it, and of course, and they are fantastic potentially. I'm simply mentioning this, that the assumption that this is necessarily good and formidable and rejuvenating democracy, I have uh, uh, my reservation. <laughs> uh, uh, I think it was Camus in his, uh, uh, I think it must have been in his Nobel speech. Uh, he, he said something which I, I increasingly think is, around. he said, I'm quoting approximately, he said, uh, until now, previous generations have thought that their task was to change the world. The task of the coming generation, he was saying, this was 1957 or something like that, he said, uh, will be to preserve it. And, you know, this is, this is what we have to think when we think about the future. Not get obsessed by the idea that progress equals technological progress. Yes, progress is, that progress is very ambivalent. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are things we want to push forward, but there are also things that are worth preserving, like the environment like the environment, an environment which was supposed to be a progressive left-wing issue, well, it's a conservative issue. So you want to preserve something. So these ideas, what is progressive, what is conservative, these ideas are blurred, just as right and left has to be redefined. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, a famous article by Leszek Kolakowski, I think it was from 1970s, uh, uh, how to be, uh, a, a, a conservative liberal socialist. That's how he would define. This was his way of saying then, 40 years ago, that the old labels no longer hold. And that was a provocation, of course, but it was also making you think, yes, on some issues, you are a progressive uh, 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 liberal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. On some issue, we are socialists, we want the welfare state, we want to look after the poor and the downtrodden, etc., etc. And on some issues, we are conservatives. There are things that are worth conserving. And maybe uh, the future of European politics will be something where these terms will have to be redefined and made meaningful again uh, to, uh, to the public, to, to, the, to, to, the, to the civil society.
but you mentioned the tyranny of the present, is that well, the, if you look at the economic model right now in Europe, if you ask 99% of the people, they would say this is the tyranny, they're not, they're not happy with it. So we need, to pr we need to have a progress. We need to change the current economic system. So let's wrap this, this up and then I'll open the floor for the, question, for the questions about what future economic model, welfare model do we need in Europe? Because now it basically looks like it's benefiting the 1%. Absolutely. Well, this is why I never bought, after 1989, the idea that this was the end of history and this was the progress and the, there was no alternative. There is no alternative. Remember that one, Tina? Okay. This was the mantra, first of neoliberal economies, and then, of course, after 1989, the political liberals, my friend, the dissidents, the political liberals got hand in hand with the economic neoliberals. And that is the root cause for the disaffection with liberalism today. The anti-liberal moment in Hungary and Poland has lots to do with that, and not just there. So yes, if, if, if we look at uh, uh, the uh, uh, future of globalization, because that's the world we live in, we cannot undo it, or it's very difficult, although we should remember that in 1914, before the war, we had globalization, and it was undone. It can be undone, so, but it can be undone through war. So, okay, let's, let's avoid that option. Uh, we want, if we are serious about being in the, accepting the globalized world, but not accepting the terms under which it has been operating, uh, 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 for the last quarter of a century, uh, uh, ranging from Washington consensus all the way uh, uh, to some of the more recent uh, uh, discoveries, such as that uh, 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 president of European Commission joins Goldman Sachs, or that uh, uh, commissioner in charge of uh, 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 competition uh, sits on 12 companies, including some registered <laughs> on dubious islands or in Panama. Okay, parenthèse refermé again. So we need to say the terms, and the terms have to be European. If we do not invent a European answer based on solidarity, this was a discussion where you ended, uh, 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 Danilo Turk, and in, in the previous debate, uh, uh, Timmermans, etc. If we do not invent a model where we would accept what I think for Europeans is a, I would almost say a self-evident proposition, that there are certain spheres that cannot be subordinated to the market. We accept the market economy, but there are certain spheres that cannot be subordinated to the market. Healthcare, culture, environment, etc. Okay, you, you understand what I mean. If we do not do something about preserving or inventing, preserving conservatives, and inventing has to be <laughs> reinvented. Uh, a European model, a European answer to globalization, we will have the choice between the American and the Chinese model. So that is the alternative for the future of Europe. Thank you. That was um, future according to you, to both of you, but I will ask now also, some others have already raised hands. I'll come back to you, Martin. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, what is the future according to you? So I'm going to, this gentleman here has been, has had a raise, hand raise. Uh, thank you. Uh, a very thought-provoking uh, discourse. May I present a slightly different perspective? I'm Ravi Chaudhary from India. One, future is not destiny. Two, we don't have to be apologetic about not predicting the future because all the past economic and political earthquakes were never predicted. Third, future is about the decisions we take today. Now, let me give three examples. The theme in the discussion this afternoon were that technology is a biggest bugbear creating all the problems. Now let's understand, science and technology is morally neutral. It is for us, the decision makers today, to direct the arc of technology, whether it will do, bring about human good 
or whether it will bring about human tragedy. You talked rightly about, Bill Gates suggested years ago that robots must be taxed. Why isn't anyone doing it? Second, we talk of inequality. Now those in power always say that equality and individual freedom are non-compromisable rights. But these two are contradictory. If you want individual freedoms of everybody, equality will never come about because those who are elitist will obviously get their way in and leaving the masses to where they belong. The elite have to be willing to sacrifice more then only we will be able to bring about equality. Now, why does it not happen? The political class doesn't take decisions because they are invariably, promptly motivated to act when they have a vision of the common danger. North Korea, everybody has unanimity. But when it is a vision of the common good, nobody is wanting to do anything, which will bring the masses up. But having said that, the if you take a slightly cosmic view, the arc of history is moving towards human unity. Take globalization, for example. Over the last 150 years, what has it brought about? I meet a stranger in Korea, I talk to him, have two dinners with him, and I'm willing to set up a joint venture. Strangers become friends. Now, that's the impact of globalization. The tragedy is that this is happening only to the elite. Now, if the 80% bottom people are, do not become a part of excluded society, don't become included into whatever politicians are doing, we have a dire future scenario. And it's up to us to take a call now. We can be the catalyst. You said, how can youth do? Youth must raise the voice. The problem in the world is not the misdeeds of a few politicians, but the silence of the many who don't become strong catalysts. French Revolution, they became the catalysts. Global civil war can happen if nothing is done. Thank you. Thank you. I will ask you, Martin, for your, your comment. Thank you. Well, I just hope that global civil war will not happen, but um, my former boss always said predictions are very difficult, particularly when they concern the future, and um, that's definitely true. Just a few words. I was a bit surprised by a rather negative evaluation of the status quo of the world and Europe today. Franz Timmermans rightly said, this is the healthiest, the most prosperous, the best trained, the best interconnected Europe that ever existed. We are even breathing healthier air than ever, even if we have difficulties with diesel and whatever. But compared to the situation 20 years ago, God, what have we achieved? When it comes to the Euro crisis, when it comes to the state crisis, when it comes to migration crisis, yes, they were all there. But we tackled them all together in Europe with European solutions. So I'm a bit baffled by the description of Europe, which is dark and dire. And I think it is fair to say that today, with the internet, with uh, modern communication possibilities, the people have the best chance ever to participate in the European process. And they are doing that, with all the difficulties. There are lots of things um, among those things happen on the internet which are very unsavory and not very pleasant. At the same time, they enable people to, partic people to participate. And when you rightly mention that the GDP of Europe and the world, and the world share of GDP in the world has go gone down from 60 to 40 percent, it means at the same time that hundreds of millions of Africans and Asians have raised out of poverty into prosperity, which is not the worst thing when it comes to globalization. At the same time, we have to tackle the consequences for Europe. So I, my pers perspective is simply, I think Europe is far more uh, energetic and far more powerful than we all believe. And one thing is for sure, Europe does not need one big leader. But what Europe really needs is that all the member states and all the politicians and national states feel a particular, particular responsibility for Europe, saying that this is our continent, this is our future, there we have to stand together and make the necessary compromises. And I think this is what it's all about, leadership in Europe, and not for one single state, not even mine to be the leader.
Thank you. We'll take your last comment. Thank you very much. I'm Ferenc Mislivets from Hungary. I'm a director of a new institute, which is called I Ask Institute of Advanced Study in a Small City, Kőszeg. But thank you for the interesting talk. And I agree that um, <coughs> painting the horizon black uh, is, is not a good, um, how to say it, it's not a good job to do when we are talking about future. But I think it's also very dangerous to, um, to submerge in self-congratulation. Um, uh, yes, there are a lot of successful parts of what we call the European construction, but altogether, um, I um, have been watching this in the last 30 years and very much participating in changes in Eastern Central Europe. It's not a success story. The European construction has a lot of damages and what was very clear from um, the presentations, we need to reinvent. Now, I agree with uh, Jacques Rupnik that um, the major structural problem is fragmentation of politics and um, the globalization of economics and the financial affairs. So what to do with that? Europe seems to me, European Union, the European construction, seem to be giving an, a, a, very, a very good answer for a long time. But somehow in the last 10, 15 years, this positive horizon is fading away and we need to find out what happened. If we want to, if we want to um, give a better future, uh, to our generations. There was too much reference to the future generation as, as if we could um, delegate responsibility for them. And I agree again with Jacques Rupnik that <laughs> there are wonderful promising people in the young gen generation. There are a lot of cynical people who, um, who actually want good jobs and, and they were born in a prosperous part of the world and they just want to use it. Now, so my question to the panel and to all of you, so how to jump out from our boxes? How to recreate the process of democratization? I have a humble answer. I think we need to restart the European movement, a new European discourse. That means including all of these um, societies which entered the European Union in the last uh, 15 years. Not, don't call them anymore um, new, the newcomers, okay? That is very belittling, it's very, uh, how to say it, it's not, not a very good idea. Just to start a new European discourse. What we had were not successful. You remember very well after 2004 and 2005, yeah, double no, Barroso, Margot Wallström were walking around uh, in Europe starting a reflection period that nothing happened. Wh who are, um, I would like to ask the previous um, uh, speaker, who, who are our interlocutors? If we have, as Timmermans, Franz Timmermans mentioned that his son calls him an unelected bureaucrat. He is an unelected bureaucrat, but that's not a blame. It's a structural problem. We should make unelected bureaucrats elected people. So we need a process of democratization on the European level that needs a new European social contract and needs a lot of work and a lot of consideration and deliberation. And I don't see the responses, actually. We have politics, the politics is Jacques Rupnik said very clearly, is happening on the nation state level. That's the problem of the European democratic deficit that policy is made by unelected bureaucrats, most of them, in Brussels and politics is made by populist or not populist politicians, but they don't have power, they don't have power enough to change these policies. But that's, that's, that's the, what the so-called European democratic deficit. Okay, I will let the two of you speak at the reception afterwards, but Tanya, and Jacques, can we wrap this up? You've heard some new ideas now, because I have already been told that we're late for dinner. Yeah, I think now the good discussion would start. First of all, I have to make now a step back. Martin, I perfectly agree. I'm not a pessimist, and I didn't want to picture a dark Europe, the, the opposite. I'm also an optimist. And when you say we don't have, a, you mentioned right, we, we are elected politicians, and I see more and more processes among the societies and citizens. We have a lot of citizens' initiatives coming to water, or whenever there is a topic, people really engage, and we have to grab that. I think more and more citizens' initiatives will be um, there, and this is very good for Europe. Just one thing to say. 
for European future, I think Europe can be really a leading force when it comes to fight against climate change, when it comes to energy renewables, we are the leading force, when it comes to um, trade, finally. So there are all the possibilities in Europe and we can be very proud, I'm very proud about that. We have challenges about European identity, we don't talk about European identity, we don't talk, we just talk about crisis, we don't talk about positive stories. And I would like to conclude this debate also on, on an optimistic note. It is nevertheless, 60 years later, it is the best peaceful project we have in the history. The European unity and integrity and solidarity, we have to just go back to these basic values on which European Union was founded. This is solidarity, this is democracy, these are fundamental rights. And I think this we all understand. I don't want to live in Europe of fear, of intolerance, of wars, or instability or inequality in 10 years from now on. And I think this is very simple message we can also pass to young generation because they don't have memory of wars that many of you have. So we have also to change the rhetorics on what European Union is based today and why we need each other more maybe than before in the globalized world. Thank you, Tanya. Jacques, your last <laughs> words, Well, I, I, I could uh, the sign just what has been said. I'm uh, very much, uh, I, I would say I'm an optimal pessimist. In other words, I, I, uh, you know Gramsci's word about the optimism of the will and the pessimism of reason. Well, you know, we are here to analyze the, cr the problem, the crisis. You didn't come here just to hear a pep talk. If I were just saying, you know, we're doing great, we're gonna do even better in the 21st, you know. I mean, uh, you would have been gone already. So we, we, we have to address the issues of today and, 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 and not be uh, sort of complacent and satisfied with, with some generalities about how great we are doing. So uh, yes, uh, as a very committed European, <laughs> I have uh, uh, observations to make about uh, the way uh, the Europe is addressing or not, or not, as it may be the case, uh, certain issues. Now, just uh, to do justice to, to our uh, uh, friend from, uh, from India, I think when you said uh, uh, scientific and technological change is morally neutral, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. Uh, if you introduce a new technology that allows people to be monitored, to put it in inverted commas, or actually without them. <laughs> Just read what Snowden has basically revealed to us, you know, about, yeah, the globally, <laughs> Orwell, we used to think was about communism in Eastern Europe. Now we discover Orwell might have, you know, interesting observations about the society we're moving in in the 21st century. So. Morally neutral, I don't know. Uh, we are now with, in biology, in new technologies, we're discovering enhanced humanity. We can enhance the brain capacities, we can enhance certain physical. You, you call this morally neutral? I certainly wouldn't. For whom is this available? Under what condition? How far should you go? These are moral questions that our societies will have to answer. So
the risk of getting Donald Trump elected. If you take simply that line, you know, you don't like your job in Kansas, you know, move to LA, move to Silicon Valley. <laughs> well, you know, you're a construction worker, not easy. So uh, 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 that's, that kind of talk simply will not do with our European fellow citizens. And this is not a rejection of globalization, it is simply making one thing that what I was saying before, if we want to invent, if we want to preserve what is a European approach, a European model of globalization. Final point about uh, uh, democracy. I didn't mean to sound pessimistic or anything like that. I simply address the problem. If you want me to ask which direction should we move, well, we have to reconnect the democracy from our national level with the European democracy. This is a very difficult task to do. I believe the Eurozone's future will depend to a large extent on that. You will not have people accepting convergence on budgetary or fiscal matters unless there is democratic legitimacy. You cannot give it this power to some unelected bureaucrats. This is a phrase that has been used this afternoon. No, you need democratic legitimacy which means you will need a European dimension of democracy. Is this federalism? That is federalism by any other name. Uh, I know the word federalism is not to be pronounced, so leave the F word out, but remains the issue. You have to have democratic legitimacy if the Eurozone, reformed Eurozone, is to survive. And I could go through a number of other issues, including security issues, migration issues about borders, which need democratic legitimacy. So yes, our democratic uh, 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 systems are in crisis at the national level. People complain about Europe, European democratic deficit. No, why should European democracy be any better than our national democracies? Look at the state our democracies are. Uh, uh, so. No, the answer would be then to reconnect domestic and European dimension of democracy. Very difficult proposition, but you said we should look forward optimistically to the future. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay, thank you very much.